India has on the whole uh, under Modi impoverished its people, created ever more inequality, shrunk the Indian market rather than expanded it. And all of this is the real reason why India is falling behind, not because of the existence of China or even India's trade with China. I mean, so I, I guess I'd like to give my answer in three parts. So the first is that uh, basically what we have now is a shift back to coalition politics. That is to say, Modi is, relies particularly on two big allies to take him over the 272 mark, which will allow him to have um, majority government. So this means that uh, he has to soften his Hindutva politics. He has to accept a lot of it. But I think so. So there is reason to imagine that he will not be able to be as hard line as he has been. However, whether this will translate into foreign policy is a separate question for a number of reasons. So let me say, first of all, that you have to understand that Modi's party, which is the BJP, which has been in power before, it was in power in coalition between 1998 and 2004, because you see, even after all the mobilization based on Hindu identity and anti-Muslim politics, which they engaged in very strongly in the 1990s, they were not able to pass the roughly 25 percent of the vote mark. They had to enter into coalition. And so this party has always been in favor of two things which do not augur very well for Indochina relations. The first is that they have, from a very early point in their history, seen China as the main enemy of India. They have always targeted China, going back to the 62 war. In fact, yes, you know, the 62 war, uh, if you think about it, was a problem, you know, was a mis it, it was based on many mistakes made by India. But because they have consistently kept up this, you know, opposition to Nehru's earlier policy of friendship with China, you know, Hindi, Hindi, Chini, Bai, Bai, you know, that Indians and Chinese were brothers, etc., etc. This policy, the BJP, the Hindu nationalist right, has essentially milked the failures of 1962 for everything they can in order to accuse any policy of friendship with China as being misguided, deluded, etc. And by keeping up a very high decibel rhetoric of this sort, they have essentially prevented a process that India needs to, to go through uh, in order to have good relations with China, in order to benefit from a good relation with China, both in terms of security and in terms of economy. I think India Indo-Chinese cooperation could go a very long way. But this whole process is being stopped. And what is that process? The Indian position on the border disputes, which is the main uh, issue that, that India keeps uh, raking up, the Indian position has been based, as many scholars in India today recognize, on a colonial position, the co colonial drawings, uh, lines drawn on a map. There are many reasons to believe that the position that India is taking is not a valid one and that the position China is taking, which is that let's sit down, negotiate, look into the interests, what works, etc. And also while doing so on the border dispute, let's advance our interests. Let's advance our cooperation on other matters. So China has always been very, shall we say, uh, giving in terms of its relationship with, with India. But without going through this process of real Realizing that India's territorial claims are not valid, that they are more open to question, Indians will not come up with any position now, uh, come up to a cooperative attitude to China, no matter who is in power. Now, having said that, given the reality that India's position was not viable, History itself, I mean, reality itself exerted a certain type of gravity on uh, Indian government so that in the period since the 1980s, basically, India and China have engaged in a lot of intensive diplomacy, which continued even under the Vajpayee government. And then also under the UPA government of Mr. Manmohan Singh from 2004 to 2014. And this led to considerable improvements in relations between India and, and China. And a creeping recognition that, yes, there should be negotiations on the border dispute. And while those negotiations take place, let's also deepen our economic relationship. So all of that was proceeding generally well until it was 
cut short by Modi. Now, and I want to talk about Modi in a minute, but let me also say one final thing before going on to Modi and the other things he's done. The key to understanding, I mean, or let me rephrase that, the UPA government in particular made big advances in good relations with China. But what you had, essentially, they achieved progress in Indo-Chinese relations, but they did not at the same time transform the discourse within India. They did not say, look, folks, it's time for us to change our attitude towards the border dispute. We need to go through a process of learning. We need to acknowledge that our position is not 100% correct. So they did not put this out in the public discourse. And that means that the Hindu right has continued to exploit anti-China sentiments in India. They have been allowed to remain. And this is a fault of the UPA government. And I think any secure progress in India can, that cannot be easily reversed relies on having this process, this ideological process in India. So so that's about uh, China and the progress. And, and, and under Mr. Modi, Essentially, Mr. Modi, I think Mr. Modi is quite well aware that India cannot win any kind of military confrontation with China. But nevertheless, little skirmishes have been exploited to the fullest in an anti-China rhetoric, which then uh, uh, consolidates the Hindu and Indian nation behind Mr. Modi, etc. So he has been totally uh, free and he has also not been particularly good at pursuing you know, the economic relationship and so on. So, I mean, quite frankly, I personally think that Modi's foreign policy generally consists of a whole bunch of photo opportunities for himself and other world leaders. You know, in fact, when Modi dresses, you know, as you may know, he has this obsession with dressing in certain ways and, you know, very expensively and so on. So that's all he seems to care about. And the only other thing he cares about is giving his corporate cronies contracts abroad, particularly, as you may know, for example, Mr. Adani accompanied Mr. Modi on a state trip to Australia and came back with a, a bunch of, you know, mining contracts and, and what have you. So these are the sorts of things. Otherwise, he really has not much of any foreign policy. So this lack of a defined foreign policy, plus a desire to exploit anti-China and, of course, anti-Pakistan sentiments in India means that Mr. Modi is not being very conducive to good relations with China. And finally, the third part, which is that Mr. Modi, like the previous BJP government, is also ideologically much more in favor of good relations and ever closer relations with the United States. The best example of this would be that, you know, when um, Mr. Vajpayee, the previous uh, BJP prime minister who was in office between 1998 to 2004, Mr. Vaj, we within days of coming to power, conducted a second nuclear test. If you remember, well, you may not remember, but you may know that he consult, conducted a second nuclear test. And he immediately following on uh, the nuclear test, he wrote a letter to President Clinton in which he made it very clear that the reason for the nuclear test is a short letter and you can find it on the web. The purpose of the Indian tests was to essentially strengthen India's defenses against China. China was regarded as the main problem. And essentially, this was, of course, uh, under Clinton, still in uh, China, US-China relations were better than what they are now. But nevertheless, Essentially, Mr. Vajpayee was saying to Mr. Clinton that India and uh, the U.S. should make common cause against China. And this tendency has continued. It has also involved India becoming ever closer to Israel as part of a larger regional strategy. And, and of course, what also unites Israel and India under Modi, Israel under Netanyahu and uh, India under Modi, and generally Zionism and Hindutva, is the common opposition to Islam and so on. So this is a part of the strategy. So Mr. Modi would dearly love to go ever closer to the United States. However, he faces two problems, as we have discussed on this, you know, many times before, with, I have discussed with you many times before, and I have said in many other places, the Western economies and the US economy in particular are not in a very strong position right now to offer anything economically attractive to most of their partners. They are not capable of uh, creating, cementing sustainable relationships where they provide some benefit as the bigger partner, as the richer partner 
to their partners. So, and on the other hand, the US and the West are not so attractive. Then what has happened, of course, is that the Ukraine war has created a situation in which Modi is forced to lean closer to Russia than it would like to, because the other part of leaning closer to the US is also, of course, to ab abandon India's historically strong relations with Russia, and which uh, have been dependent on two things in particular. One is, of course, great defense cooperation, and the other is a certain economic relationship. Now, defense cooperation uh, has been certainly diluted on the part of the Indians who are seeking weapons more and more from Western countries rather than from Russia. But at the same time, with the Ukraine uh, conflict, the rise in the price of oil has put India in a bind and also has given both carrot and stick to maintain at least some kind of decent relation with Russia. The carrot, of course, is that India is able to import oil cheaply because without this cheap oil, the rate of inflation in India would go up massively because India is very heavily reliant on imported oil. So there is that. And the uh, the stick, of course, is that uh, sorry, that's the stick that in India can uh, India needs to import that. And the carrot is that, of course, many of Modi's corporate cronies are making a lot of money importing cheap Russian oil and then selling it on to European customers as Indian exports, etc. So that they, there is this kind of circular trade going on. Russia also benefits, etc. So. Under the, a new arrangement of rupee-ruble trade that Russia and India have, India has been buying a lot of Russian oil. But on the other side, by the way, the Russians are not particularly happy with the outcome of these arrangements. They had entered it very happily, hoping that everything would be fine. But what they are finding is that while India is buying a lot from Russia in the form of oil, etc., there is not much that Russia needs wants to buy from India. So Russia is ending up with a pile of rupees it doesn't know what to do with. So that's another element. So that in this ever closer relations with the West, as India has had to, would like to distance itself both from Russia and China, but it is finding it hard to do so in the case of Russia. In the case of China as well, I would say that, you know, India, uh, India's markets are today like ordinary neighborhood markets in India are more and more reliant on importing goods from China, which being very efficiently produced, inexpensive, keep down the rate of inflation, which would otherwise go even higher than it has already gone. So India is reliant on that. Many Indian businessmen would like to keep good relations with India. But nevertheless, India continues to uh, provoke China by joining military exercises in the South China Sea with the so-called freedom of navigation exercises, joining the Quad, uh, getting ever closer with Japan, being part, happily engaging in the U.S. attempt to transform the Asia-Pacific into the Indo-Pacific, and so on with India as a major tool. So it's a complex situation. Modi would dearly love to be even closer to the U.S., but circumstances are not permitting that. So, but nevertheless, Modi is not eager to, to give in to China. And one final point, many uh, of Modi's acolytes uh, in the media, in scholarship, in the scholarly world, one of the things they point to is that India is losing, that the strategy of moving closer to China initiated under the UPA, Congress-led UPA government of 2004 to 14, has been very bad for India because India now has a very big trade deficit and India is not, you know, is sliding in its uh, ra world rankings and, and so on. But the fact is that if you want to do something about India's trade deficit, China is not stopping you. China is not Ch China is offering to sell its products, but China is not stopping India from becoming a manufacturing hub. What becoming a manufacturing hub, uh, a, an economic power requires, however, is a muscular industrial policy, a clear development strategy which expands the Indian market. India cannot be a export platform for the rest of the world. And in any case, India first needs to fulfill the needs of its extremely deprived citizens. It needs to increase their incomes. It needs to increase their consumption. It needs to increase. And, and so creating a larger Indian market with a well-employed, with high employment, good wages, will create a vast stimulus for India's growth, which can be fulfilled by any you know, by a decent economic and industrial policy. But India is not following this route. India has, on the whole, uh, under Modi, impoverished its people. 
created ever more inequality, shrunk the Indian market rather than expanded it. And all of this is the real reason why India is falling behind, not because of the existence of China or even India's trade with China. I would say that today, uh, a lot of educated Indians are all too happy to raise questions about the one China policy, like the US is trying to do. It's trying to make it ambiguous, right? And it has always been ambiguous. As you know, the moment that the US recognized uh, China in the 1970s, it also passed the Taiwan Relations Act so that it would send arms to China. So that on the one hand, it was saying, you know, one China principle on one China policy. And on the other hand, it was already diluting it. So India is a can, Indian opinion can go in that direction. Unfortunately, like I said, many people in India recognize that the whole narrative of Indochina relations has been very problematic in India. But these people still remain a minority. They are, to my, in my view, they are right, but they are confined to certain niches in the public discourse. The mainline public discourse is always that, you know, whatever China does should be regarded as, you know, authoritarian, hegemonic, you know, trying to be hegemonic in, in Asia and elsewhere and uh, pursuing its own economic interests and, and, and so on and so forth. And I mean, not saying that China should not pursue its own economic interests, but I think China's genius has lain in trying to find mutual benefits with its partners that, you know, we benefit, but you also benefit. And this is the way in which China has built its relations with its many, many partners in the region and in the world. That is a very important question, and I would say that we do not fully know the answer. Uh, on the one hand, one would hope that the existence of the coalition government would pull some sort of restraint on India vis-a-vis -vis China, that even when the Congress-led government was improving relations with China, it did not do enough to dislodge the false narrative about India about the India-China border dispute in India. And without, with that not having been done, it's quite possible that Modi will be able to make Indian opinion lean in an anti-China direction in those circumstances. However, so, so that's another element in the situation. And a third element in the situation is how responsible or irresponsible is India's defense leadership? It, will the heads of the various armed services be able to say to the uh, prime minister, look, prime minister, this is a very dangerous position to take. We cannot stand up to any military challenge, uh, any military conflict with China. So please be careful, etc. We don't know whether this is the case. And indeed, from my reading, it's clear that over the last decade, the Modi government has been introducing changes in the army, which are likely to put yes people in top positions. So that, you know, this is, and I also feel that uh, both vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and vis-a-vis -vis China, the possibility that the Modi government will act in a completely delusional manner, you know, not based on any realistic assessment of India's strengths or for that matter, India's interests, but in a completely delusional manner in its effort to be pro-US and unmindful of in the limitations of India's military or economic preparedness they may very well take a problematic, a deeply problematic position. They may involve India in wars. I don't put it past them. Given the way in which Modi has taken terribly consequential decisions like demonetization, like the COVID lockdowns, without a care for what happens to ordinary Indians, I think that this kind of decision is not beyond him. I would say that uh, among the educated elite, which unfortunately for us, for the Indochina relations, is among the most pro-US in the world. The middle class in India is among the most pro-US in the world. Therefore, their tendency is to accept what the US says as the correct position, rather than, you know, India has had a good anti-imperialist past. And in the first uh, many decades of independence, much of India's foreign policy discourse did follow an attempt to understand imperialism, its history, the need to resist it, and so on. For up-to-date analysis and underground sentiments from China, click here to visit our website, thechinaacademy.org, and join our audience community of over 150 million followers.